This revision video is going to examine the main stores and processes or flows within the carbon cycle. We can see an example of all of those different flows and stores on the diagram that we can see on the screen. It's worth noting just before we start going through those that the numbers on this diagram are given in petagrams. So um, that's the equivalent of one gigaton or one billion tonnes of carbon. So for example, um, the uptake from the ocean being 92, that's 92 petagrams per year or 92 gigatons or 92 billion tonnes per year. The stores, however, are given as total amounts, so the total amounts stored um, in each of those reservoirs. If we start with the stores, we can see that by far and away, the biggest store on the Earth is the Earth's crust. So the rocks, the sedimentary rocks that make up the Earth's crust, they store a um, hundred million gigatons or a hundred million petagrams worth of carbon. Now that is a huge amount, um, but actually most of it doesn't really do anything in terms of the carbon cycle. Most of that um, carbon is locked away um, within sedimentary rocks and it doesn't move out of that store. It's, it's very much kind of sequestered and locked away in that, in that store. The second largest store um, is the oceans. Now the oceans are important in terms of exchanging carbon with other stores, particularly um, with the atmosphere. So 38,000 petagrams of carbon um, is stored within the oceans. Um, most of that carbon um, is dissolved within the water um, or possibly um, forms part of some of the marine creatures that live um, within it. Another significant store um, is fossil fuels. So fossil fuels make up about 4,000 petagrams of carbon. Now these fossil fuels have been formed over millions of years by the burial and compaction of organic matter and over time that organic matter, whether that's plant or animal material, has been compressed to form coal or oil um, or natural gas. And as we'll see, um, they are being returned to the atmosphere through the combustion um, of those fossil fuels. The next most significant store um, is actually soils. One thing that often gets overlooked when we think about the carbon cycle is the carbon that's held within the soil. That carbon um, is there as a result of either weathering from um, rocks that make up the crust or through the, the decaying of plant and animal material. The atmosphere is the next largest store that takes up 750 petagrams of carbon um, and is probably the most commonly spoken about store when we think about changes that are happening within the carbon cycle. We're all aware of how the um, composition of our atmosphere and the amount of carbon dioxide within the atmosphere is changing and the impacts that it has. The smallest store overall is um, the biosphere, particularly plants store about 560 petagrams of carbon. So a relatively small percentage when we consider it um, in relation to things like the oceans, um, but a significant store nonetheless because that carbon is very easily moved um, out of that store. If we now turn our attention to the flows of carbon moving material between um, those stores, we can see that there are some quite important processes taking place. Um, probably one of the most important, um, and most obvious one of those, um, is photosynthesis. We can see that happening in here, um, absorbing around about 120 petagrams of carbon um, every year. So around 120 billion tonnes of carbon um, is absorbed by photosynthesis. Um, it's worth remembering that that happens um, within plants, but not just plants that um, exist on the land. Also, marine organisms photosynthesize. So um, plankton, algae within the water, um, within the oceans, they are responsible for photosynthesis as well. Um, so these organisms, they're using sunlight and they're combining that sunlight with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and with water from the soil um, and they're using that to create carbohydrates and in that way we are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Oxygen is a byproduct of that process 
um, and the rate of photosynthesis varies um, depending on the temperature, um, the availability of water and also um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as well. So having an increase in, of CO2 in the atmosphere can actually lead to increased rates of photosynthesis. Um, another important process is um, that of respiration and respiration can take place uh, within any living organism. So um, within plants, within um, microorganisms, within the soil um, and even, it's not mentioned on here, um, but even within um, animals as well. So any um, living creature, any living organism um, undergoes respiration. Um, and this is where an organism will use carbohydrates, maybe um, produced during photosynthesis, to carry out their life functions. And um, it's going to take oxygen from the atmosphere that's going to be combined with the, the carbohydrates and it's going to use that to release that stored energy. Um, and actually plants account for about 60 petagrams um, of the CO2 that was returned to the atmosphere each year. So we can see that although photosynthesis um, within plants absorbs a significant amount of carbon dioxide, half of that is actually returned back to the atmosphere um, through respiration. So it's important to understand the balance um, of these different flows. Um, decomposition is another important process as well. So if we think about what it calls here as litter fall. Um, so taking perhaps 60 uh, petagrams of carbon into the soil um, as a result of decomposition. And this is just when dead organic matter is broken down um, and that carbon dioxide um, is released as a result. And this is what helps um, to ensure that carbon and other nutrients are continually recycled around the world. Um, another important process which isn't mentioned um, on this diagram, um, but it does kind of have connections to the rivers that we can see here, um, is that of weathering. Um, so weathering can happen in a number of forms, but um, one of the most common is um, the process of carbonation. This is where carbon dioxide within the atmosphere um, is dissolved um, into water, which forms carbonic acid. That acid, um, when it rains, reacts with minerals. Um, that slowly dissolves those minerals, which are then transported via rivers and streams into the oceans. Um, which then leads us on to the next step in that process. That once that carbon is in the ocean, um, it can actually sink to the bottom and be buried um, in sediments within the Earth's crust. So um, this can also be added to by the death of marine organisms, which might be settling to the bottom of the sea. And they're going to get buried by layers of sediment on top. Um, and very slowly, um, that carbon is locked away um, as layers of sedimentary rock on the, on the sea floor. Eventually, though, um, what will happen to that ocean floor um, is, as a result of plate movement and plate tectonics, that sediment will be subducted at a plate boundary. Um, the rock will heat up, um, it, part of it will start to melt, and that carbon that's locked away within that sedimentary rock is going to be returned to the atmosphere through volcanic eruptions. So volcanic eruptions only release about 0.1 gigatons of carbon, Okay, about 100 million tonnes of carbon every year. Um, and that carbon predominantly comes from um, carbon that's been locked away on the seafloor in layers of rock um, for millions of years. Now, there are other um, methods of um, transferring carbon. We haven't mentioned combustion yet, but that can happen um, either through the combustion of fossil fuels. So they emit um, at least six billion tonnes um, of carbon every year. That number is actually increasing and has increased significantly probably since this diagram was made. Human activity um, through burning fossil fuels actually emits closer to um, eight or nine billion tonnes of carbon um, uh, in the present day. Combustion can also happen um, when any organic material is burned. So if we think about deforestation and land use change um, and maybe some of the fires that go along with that, they are also returning um, carbon to the atmosphere. Um, 
even though fires only consume maybe about 20% of the, the carbon that's stored within trees, um, they are emitting um, quite a significant amount of carbon every year. The other exchange of carbon, um, which is relatively neutral, um, is the uptake and loss of carbon from the oceans. So carbon dioxide can dissolve into the water. We can see that oceans take up about 92 petagrams of carbon and carbon dioxide can also diffuse out of the water. So we can see that overall as well, oceans release about 90 petagrams of carbon. And while I said that they were relatively balanced, we can see that actually more carbon is being taken up by the ocean than is being lost. And this is really significant. Um, we'll come on to look in a future video about how um, changes to our atmosphere are impacting the oceans. And one of the impacts um, on the ocean is that it is becoming more acidic as a result of the additional carbon that is being dissolved within that water. The final step in this process of understanding the, the main stores and flows within the carbon cycle is to understand that although um, we have these processes occurring all the time, some of them are happening uh, much more quickly or much more slowly than others. Whereas with the water cycle, very often um, the flows of water are all happening at a fairly kind of even constant rate. With carbon, some of those flows are happening much more quickly, part of what we might call the fast carbon cycle. Um, and other um, flows are happening a little bit more slowly, what we might refer to as being part of the slow carbon cycle. So the fast carbon cycle, this is going to include anything that transfers carbon quite quickly back to the atmosphere or from the atmosphere. Um, so photosynthesis is a good example of a process that's part of the fast carbon cycle. Combustion as well, um, respiration, uh, deforestation and land use change, and finally also um, the ocean exchanges that go on to so the uptake. Um, or loss of carbon dioxide from, from the ocean. These processes are returning carbon to the atmosphere um, on the sort of time scales of sort of days, weeks, months, years um, to, to move that carbon from one store to another. The slow carbon cycle, on the other hand, is going to involve processes um, like weathering, which happens much more slowly. Um, the burial and compaction of sediments. That process can take millions of years um, and lock carbon away for a very, very long time. Um, and then connected to that, um, volcanic eruptions. Although those eruptions themselves might happen suddenly, um, the carbon that they are returning to the atmosphere um, has been locked away for a very, very long period of time. So we can almost see the Earth as having two carbon cycles rather than one. Um, although they are connected, the fast carbon cycle um, is having a much more dramatic effect in the, sh in the short term um, in terms of changing the size of some of those stores of carbon. Things like the slow carbon cycle, weathering and burial and compaction and volcanic eruptions, they are returning and moving carbon um, much, much more slowly. The final thing to say about the carbon cycle is that if we were to ignore the burning of fossil fuels, if we were to eradicate that from our, um, uh, our list here and we were to get rid of any human induced deforestation um, and land use change, if we were to get rid of those, then actually everything else would be in the process or the, the state of dynamic equilibrium. So over a long period of time, the carbon cycle has naturally found a balance whereby all of the um, flows taking carbon out of stores are balanced by the flows returning carbon to those stores.
Um, so over time, the size of those stores, the oceans, the soils, the crust, they're not getting any bigger or any smaller. Um, however, when we do introduce things like the burning of fossil fuels or um, deforestation or land use change or agriculture, um, then we start to upset that dynamic equilibrium um, and that then has knock-on effects um, for our climate and for other earth systems. So it's really important that you're able to um, understand how those processes work. It's important that you're able to describe and explain those processes, understand how they relate to one another, and also understand this difference between the fast and the slow carbon cycle. Um, and appreciate that these processes are operating on very, very different timescales.